We do welcome everyone. It's good to see all who are here with us on this last Sunday in June, June 27th. We welcome each and every one that is here and uh, glad that you're here with us in person. And we also, we do welcome those who are online now, who are virtually watching us. We welcome you as well. Let's all stand as Al comes and leads us in our call to worship. Hymn number 249, Glorify Thy Name, and our opening prayer. sing a song like this, I pray that we who profess to be Christians, that Father, other people can see you in us, that Father, we will glorify you and glorify your name. I thank you, Lord, for each one that is here. I pray, Lord, for each one be blessed. And those that aren't able to be with us, we know that we have some traveling. We know we have some working. Father, we pray that you will be with them. Let them know that they are in our prayers. Do take charge of your service this morning. Guide and direct us. Open our hearts, our minds to receive your word. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I don't think there's only a couple of things basically to make an announcement on. Next Sunday is July the 4th, so just be aware of that. Uh, I guess a lot of people uh, who aren't, we may be out of town because it may be a long weekend since um, they look like they'll have off that Monday in, in honor of July the 4th. So a lot of people will probably take off Friday, so it'll be on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and so forth. So be aware of that. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we'll have Bible study from 6 to 7, and I think, if I, am I correct, Debbie Trimmy, in saying that the first Wednesday in July, the time will change for that again, or is that the general consensus? Okay, so the general consensus is that that, that time will change the first Wednesday in July, not this coming Wednesday, but the following one, I think, from 6.30 to 7.30. Uh, so that will take place there, and I'll give you another reminder uh, next Sunday, but this coming Wednesday will be from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Find us on Facebook and also on YouTube. If anybody would like to have a copy of the Baptist message, I'll put it in the back back there, and you can arm wrestle over it. I only have one copy. So if you'd like to have it, you can, you can have one and see what's going on with that. Um, anything else that we need to be aware of of anything else going on as we uh, count down a couple of three more days to June and we're heading into July the 1st. July the 1st will be Thursday, so 
counting down June. June's almost gone. You can say it is gone, but you only have you still have a few days for that. So Al will come at this time and he'll lead us in another hymn, hymn number 446. Take time to be whole. concerns and I ask you to continue to pray and to remember different people and different ones of course the military personnel and all our Christian missionaries of all denominations pray for them and remember them in prayer as well do be in prayer for our country our leaders our state our city our community and different other places as well um, traveling mercies for Johnny and Debbie Garrett uh, for the next few days until Wednesday, they'll be in, uh, and as of right now, they're in Vidalia, Louisiana. Uh, so they're not too far from here. What's that? No, ma'am. Sorry. That's Vidalia, Georgia. Yes. 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 Yeah, I thought the same thing too. I'm going to tell you what happened. A couple, a few years ago, we was in Vidalia, both of us. And my wife and he says, where did we get the onions? <laughs> what did the lady tell you? Not here. <laughs> Not here. She said, you're in, the wrong, you're in the wrong state. I said, really? Oh, she, no. said, she said, really? Yeah, so we, a lot of people think it, but it's Vidalia, Georgia. And basically close to where Al's from. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a few miles, a little country yeah. town, really. Yeah. A little place like that, but yet it's famous for the Vidalia onions <laughs> in Georgia. But they're in Vidalia, Louisiana. Uh, they'll be coming home sometime on Wednesday, uh, concluding their month-long trip that they had taken uh, as well. So continue to pray for them as they are on the road, as they are there taking it easy. Uh, continue to remember, of course, Johnny uh, Garrett with his ongoing battle with his cancer. Also pray for Debbie's mom and sister and other family members as well, especially a mom not doing too well. She has some health issues that she is dealing with and other family members um, as well within her family, so do pray for them. Um, continue, of course, to remember Melissa and Lisa, 
um, as they uh, also with the loss of mom and dad, the Duval family, pray for them and remember them in prayer and their, um, and their loss and what they are dealing with at this point in their lives. So do, do pray for them. Prayers of Thanksgiving, my wife and I had a, uh, a, a nice trip going up to Gatlinburg uh, this past uh, Monday. Uh, we came back yesterday and it was a nice trip. Uh, friends of yours that you know of uh, told me to tell everyone hi and send their love. And that is Joe and Brent Frazier. They are still in, up around, they're in Knoxville, Tennessee now. And so they told me to tell everybody hi, express love, and they're doing well. We got to spend Tuesday, uh, Tuesday afternoon with them for a while. Um, and so they, they're doing okay, just continue to pray for them, but they told me to tell y'all hi. Um, just others, again, on our prayer list, just remember them also in prayer. Other prayer requests or concerns or Thanksgiving or whatever you would like to share with us this morning? Anyone or anything? Linda. I went to see Mom Thursday. She's doing really, really good. Oh, good, good. She got her hair done. So got her hair done. She said she did it herself. But... <laughs> <laughs> she looked really nice. I put a picture on Facebook. I don't okay. know if anybody saw it, but she looked really, really nice. And she's still telling you she does everything for everybody, too? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> She goes out, she, she takes her car, her girlfriends go places. Okay, well, good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. And yes. she still works there. Okay. She's still she's, doing, she's doing real good. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, good. I'm glad she's active. And <laughs> we only get to see her 20, 30 minutes when we go to see her, but right. um, yes. we try to go at least once a week. Right. You know, with everything going on. But right. when we get there, she just, oh, she's just so delighted. That's good. So cute. Yes. <laughs> right. Wow. She's doing good. Well, good. Pray for everyone there. They have a new director coming. Miss Jill's been there for uh, ever since mom's been there. I think she said three or four years. She's been there. She's wonderful. And they have, um, she's actually retiring to go closer to her grandchildren. I got you. Okay. So they have a new lady coming and she okay. starts in July, I think. So okay. Just prayers for sure. their transition right. and, um, and for Miss Jill who's retiring. So she's a wonderful. I hate, well, I hate to lose her, but, you know, she's, sure. she's going to have a good time. And yep. it. <laughs> Everything changes, yes, absolutely. Uh, other prayer requests? Tinker. I have a prayer of Thanksgiving. Okay. The bone in my shoulder is not broken. Not broken, not cracked? Not cracked, not fractured, not nothing. nothing. It's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Scott, I don't have to wear that stupid sling. <laughs> However, the, the ligaments in my wrist, which is always worse than my shoulder every okay. day, yes. are like damaged. So okay, I'm yes, okay. Stretch. Right, so stretch, yeah. So there's still a lot of pain and swelling sure. there. Okay. But I can deal with this brace better than I can be deal with, with, with the sling. <laughs> so I think that's a total blessing. Yes, it is. And a prayer of Thanksgiving, that's good. That is good. That is awesome. So, yes, prayer of thanks. Others? Danny, Brian. Uh, Good, good, awesome. Oh, good, good. Good, I'm glad they got. Right. Actually, you're only Tuesday morning. Okay. I'm just glad, yeah, I'm just glad they got in with all the delays that are going on and cancellations and everything else with this, with all the airlines. It's crazy. You know, so I'm glad they got back and they got in anyhow. Pray for your co-worker. Yeah, for him and the family and the friends. Yes, absolutely. For sure will. Yes. Ginger. I was continuing to pray for my family. It's getting smaller, but praying for my family, for Dolores, my husband, myself, and the children. Okay. And grandchildren. Yes. And unspoken. Unspoken. Okay. All right. We'll do. Sandy. Uh, Mr. Larry's brother did pass away. Oh, I'm sorry. Larry, so just and, you know, his wife and children and Mr. Larry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Is that his last sibling? That's his last brother. He oh. still has two living sisters. Okay, all right, you whiz. 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's always hard. That's always hard. So, yeah, remember Mr. Lowry and the rest of the family members. We sure will, yes. And then Abby is in Orlando. Yeah, and they come back tomorrow. They'll be traveling all day tomorrow. Okay, so pray for Abby as she, she is in Orlando and coming back from there, okay? Uh, she's not at Disney World, so she's just in Orlando. She was at Universal. Universal, okay. <laughs> oh, she did go to Universal, okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, so but that's good, though. So, probably mercies for her. Other prayer requests. Um, just pray for different people as well. Pray for our, our country. It seems as though another is it a pandemic or another COVID thing has just cropped up again. I think they're having issues in Missouri and, um, and other places as well where this new strain has cropped up. And, uh, and according to some reports, uh, some of the stuff now in, in say like in Missouri is closed down and some places and other places are, went, are closed down because of the new uh, strain of this COVID that has cropped up. So pray for our state and pray for all that's going on with this COVID related issues that are taking place or are happening uh, with, with the different things. So yes. Um, now I follow baseball, and, and I noticed that North Carolina State, half, uh, some of the players, uh, unfortunately, got COVID, and they couldn't play uh, against Vanderbilt for the final game. And so they had to forfeit their last game because of the COVID uh, th situation. I thought that was a shame. Uh, so anyhow, so, uh, so it's still, still with us, it's still around, and we just need to pray for each other concerning that. So pray for each other. Uh, and traveling mercies for others who are traveling and will be traveling as well. Mr. Billy, need to pray for Mr. Billy. Well, uh, Ruth, Ruth is home and doing uh, good. She's good. A walker, but, uh, good. She's uh, doing good. Good. She's about 92 years old. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as she keeps on trucking, she's doing good. So pray for Mr. Billy and his family and his clan as well as he has many of them that are dealing with different health issues also. So do pray for them. Pray for those who are not with us for whatever reason. We have a, a few people that are out, a few people that are not here. But pray and pray for those who are watching us online and pray for them and their families and, and for maybe even what they may be going through or taking place as well. Um, and I'm sure we have many unspoken prayers also that we need to go up. Debbie. Yeah, he's back in the back. Yes, remember, remember Mr. Henry back there and, and other senior adults as well. So we sure will. Yes, absolutely. And uh, pray for the people this past week, from what I understand while we're going, uh, a few people have gotten water or had flooding issues as far as in different things. So pray for the different people in the Slotel area when uh, every time it seems as though we get this hard rain, this impact, uh, it seems as though... Uh, for whatever reason, the water is just not going down and, and it impacts people's houses or places or whatever. So, yeah, in different parts of Slidell. So pray for uh, different people in, in our area that have been affected by the flooding, uh, the torrential rains that we, we, are get, we have gotten and it looks like we may get, hopefully maybe no more, but it looks like we may get during the uh, summer. But Janet told me to shh. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that worked, but it doesn't. But anyway, we we'll are be praying for that. Anyone else? As always, pray for each other during the course of the week, because you never know what may come up and what may take place. So pray for each other, and always pray for the many people in need of Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And as Tinker and others and I and we all say, give thanks to the Lord for his many answered prayer as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, as we come now again before your throne of grace and mercy, we lift up all the prayers that have been mentioned and even the many unspoken. We lift them all up and we pray for your help, for your grace, and for your mercy. Lord, we, we lift up our country, our leaders, our state, our city. We lift up all that's going on throughout our country. The COVID-19, the 
new strain of COVID, the chaos and the other problems that are going on and the, uh, the unrest and the many other things that are taking place throughout the land. We pray for your help and for your grace and for your mercy. The many that have been lifted up here this morning, uh, this one Danny's co-worker with stage four cancer, we pray for him and his family. We lift him up and ask for help and grace and mercy and for healing. If according to your will, we lift him up as well as others. We pray for Johnny and Debbie Garrett as they are traveling and as they are in Vidalia, but also for them as they travel back, but also be with their family, Debbie's mom, and also Johnny's mom and, and, and dad and um, uh, stepdad. Uh, uh, pray for them and the family as well. Be with all of them and help them also. Uh, we lift up many others, Ginger, Dolores, Al, as they deal with their health, as well as many others here, Mr. Henry, as well as many others. We lift up, Father, many people that may be traveling and are traveling. Abby and her clan and many others that are traveling or will be traveling. Watch over them, be with them, and help them, Lord, as they travel and, and be with them. We thank you, Lord, for the many answered prayer. We thank you for helping us, for being with us, and for watching over us as well. Lord, we pray for Mr. Larry and his family at the loss and the death of his brother, and I lift him up, and I pray for him and the family, and ask that you'll be with them and help them. We pray for the Damal family with the loss of mom and dad, and be with them, Lord, and fill their void as well with your grace, your love, and your help in their lives as well. Again, we lift everything up, and we just pray for help, grace, and mercy in all of our lives. Be with us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. And Lord, we especially pray for those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray for salvation for all in need of Jesus Christ. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us stand at this time as Al now comes and leads us in our offertory hymn, 337. I know whom I have believed.
you. We want to thank you for all that you've done and all that you've given to us and all you have done for us over the years. How indeed it is by your hand that you have providentially helped us and given to us things needed in our lives. And so, Lord, we come now and we give you back a portion of what you have blessed us with. And we ask, Lord, that you will see too that all is collected and is used for the furnace of your kingdom for the spreading of the gospel. And Lord, may you bless both the gift and the giver. In the name of Jesus. Amen. turn if you will as we look at the second part of the prodigal son now we're going to see the second prodigal son from Luke chapter 15 in verses 25 through 32 and as you're turning let me just share with you the scripture that's written in our bulletin today coming from Luke chapter 8 in verse 16 through 18 no one lights a lamp and hides it in the jaw and puts it under a bed instead he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given even more, but whoever does not have even what he thinks he has will be taken from him as well. And that's coming from the Word of God. And here the parable of the prodigal son, again, I'll call it part two, we read from these passages here, and it tells us now of the elder son or the older son, however yours may read. I like to call him the older son, since it was the younger son that first left and went into a far country. <clears throat> But now understand that the older son represents the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that muttered, of course, to Jesus in verse 2 of chapter 15, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Up until now, at this point, they had stand, they stood com comfortably outside the story, so they thought, passing judgment on the prodigal, his father, and even passing judgment on Jesus himself. You know, the, the Pharisees, they always love to do things like that. They were mean, they were cruel, heartless. You know, if you were not basically one of the boys or one of them, they treated you very cruel. Now, Jesus ingeniously, he turns the table on them. Now he's putting them under the microscope and showing them for who they really are. Understand, in life, sinners come in two basic varieties. The youngest son, he represents the straightforward sinner. He does it. There's no question about it. What he did, he sinned, he done wrong, he went out and did it. The oldest son, or the elder son, he does seek what we call secretive sins. Sins they think nobody sees or nobody's aware of what they're doing. And on the outside, they look good. But as Jesus talked about the religious people and also the many Pharisees and Sadducees, not all of them, but many of them, it, 
On the outside, they look good, but inside, they're full of dead men's bones. They look like, you know, they look like a whitewashed tomb. Everybody's been to a tomb. And you see how nice it looks on the outside on some of them. But we all know what's inside is dead and corrupt. And so is the case here. But again, remember, the son, youngest son, he was the straightforward sinner. When the oldest son, he was the secret sinner. He'd done things secretly as well. And we know what it says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there, in the world, there's no such thing as a non-sinner. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that doesn't give us an excuse to continue to sin. As a believer, we need to strive to be like Jesus and do what he would have us to do. So today, let us read about the older son. Like these religious leaders and their secret sins and also the rebellion that actually took place with the oldest son that we will see here in verses 25 through 32 of Luke chapter 15. Notice first of all in verses 25 through 28 we have the angry son. Notice what anger does. Notice what, what takes place in all that, that is happening in it. And it says, meanwhile, now remember, now the contents is that the youngest son is back, they throw in a feast, the youngest son has repented of his sin, he's asked for grace, for mercy, and for help from the father, and the father has given him forgiveness, help, grace, and mercy, as he came back and he repented. So now there's a party going on, there's a feast happening. Oh, there's a big hadoo, all that's taking place. So it says, meanwhile, while this is going on, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. The servant said, hey, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Isn't this amazing? People assume that the older son represents a true believer because he's at home doing what the father, you know, supposedly doing what the father told him to do and doing all the things he thought. But as it will turn out, as we will see, the older son is just as lost and hopelessly enslaved to sin as the younger brother. Yet, he won't admit it. He won't come clean with it. You see, he's in denial. That's what we're going to see as well. He's in denial of his own sin and his own identity of where he truly is in life. The older brother, at this point, he's out in the field. He's overseeing a crew of probably a lot of servants that are working. And all he is doing is telling them what to do, how to do, or whatever. I mean, yeah, he's supervising, okay? He's, you know, he's out there supervising all of them. Now, to his surprise, he comes home, out in the field. No one's told him anything. And there's a party going on. And he knew nothing about it. Absolutely nothing. He is surprised to hear the music and the feast. And there's probably a lot of people in, in, in the house. A lot of things are going on. So the question is, why wasn't he told? Why wasn't it? Is it that the older son didn't have a better relationship or had or didn't even have a relationship with the father as much as the youngest son didn't have a relationship with the father? Did both of them, or both of them out of fellowship with the father, just like the youngest son we saw out of fellowship and going to the far country, where the oldest son now is at home? But yet, we see that he and the father, they don't have a communication going on. There's something wrong between their relationship. Now, he finds out that his brother is back. 
And instead of being happy, joyous, that his brother has come back safely, that he's not away dead, that he didn't hurt himself seriously or anything, he becomes very angry when he finds out his brother. Now, I, I know some of you, I know I got brothers and you've got brothers. Some of you sisters, you have other sisters, and maybe sometimes you wish that they were gone and not come back. I don't know. But, I mean, I've got brothers, but I like to see them, you know. I don't wish any, any ill feeling on them or any harm or anything. And, and to know that they're safe and sound would make me happy. But instead of me being happy here, he's angry. He's angry when he finds out. Now, he's, only, and he's angry not only at the fact that his brother has come back, but he's also angry at dad or his father for allowing him to come back and for throwing this party for this wayward son of his. I want you to key on that word, that wayward son of his. Not his brother, but his father's son, because that's going to come up in a minute concerning his father's son. Now, we see here his true feelings have come out over the years and what's taken place here. The resentment toward not only his brother, but also his father. Now it really surfaces that he really didn't care for his father's son. So, so we see that he's angry. You know, the Word of God relates to us that, you know, we need to be careful as well in anger or resentment or things happen and, and we hide things or we do things in secret. And the Word of God relates to us in, in Numbers chapter 32 and in verse 23 it says that, know this, but if you fail to do this, you will be sitting against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. You know, sooner or later, your sin will surface to the top. Many people, they do things secretively that they know they should not do. And sooner or later, it comes out. You know, I've heard stories where people have done things in the past, uh, other things, and, they, and, they, and they're dumbfounded by what they thought this person had done. They never dreamed that that person was doing such things or had done things in their life until they find out about it. I don't know about you, but sooner or later you find out these things. Either while the person is living or after the person is dead and you find out and go, wow, I never knew that that person did all those terrible things. Doing things in secret. And so now it comes up. And the Word of God also relates to us in Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 12 and 13, here God's Word warns us and tells us concerning it. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Out of the heart comes these things. Out of the heart comes all of these things as Jesus so relates to us. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. You know, there are people out there who think they will never stand before God and give an account of their actions. You know, so be careful how you do and what you do. But again, what we see here as well is that contrary to what we may have thought about the older son, his heart was not right. There were things going on. He needed a heart, I call it a heart transplant, but he needed a heart change. And evidently he didn't have a relationship with the father. And that's where the heart transplant begins. It's a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so his heart, was he was, had bitterness and anger and everything stored up there. And now it was all coming out. His heart was full of, uh, of sin, envy, hatred. He was angry. He allowed his anger to fester in him allowed him to consume him. 
Don't we have a story about two brothers where this happened as well at the beginning of time? Was not Cain and Abel in the same boat? Was not Cain stored up with anger and bitterness and hostility? And what happened? He killed his own brother, murdered him. And we see this episode taking place throughout the Bible. But not only throughout the Bible, we read about it in the paper, we hear about it in the news, and for some of us, you hear about it from your own families, all families that you know of. One brother hating or getting angry for another brother, or one sister getting angry at another sister, and it, and it just, things happen, and wishing many things that should not be done. It's terrible. The Pharisees here, now understand, this is about the Pharisees and the religious leaders that Jesus here is talking about. You see, they remain on the outside of the celebration that was being presented here. And it, it is true. The Pharisees, as Jesus is relating to them, they were a bunch of angry people and outrage. And they were very outraged by the grace shown to, what, the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus was eating with. They were angry about this, that here Jesus, a rabbi, a man they thought was from God, eating with sinners and tax collectors. Oh, they didn't like this at all. So understand, this is what, we, this is what we're seeing here. The older son represents the Pharisees and, the, and religious leaders that were angry. They were upset. And so they're on the outside looking at Jesus and saying, how dare this man even associate with such people as these, these tax collectors, these sinners, these people, these, and there's no telling what's in there, prostitutes and whatever else. And yet here he is. But yet Jesus says, I've come, not for the righteous, but for those who are in need of a physician. And Jesus is the physician that every sinner needs. Every sinner is in need of the great physician. For you see, the heart has got to be changed. And here, we can see, there's a heart problem. So he's angry. And he's allowing this anger now to keep him from celebrating. Also from being joyous and happy. Have you ever seen people with just faces that are not happy and not joyous? Is, is, is there something that they're festering? Something that they have bottled up and they're allowing it to control their lives? Rather than giving it up to the Lord and allowing joy and happiness to come into their lives. Maybe you know some people like that. And it's possible that they're, they're allowing this to fester. They're allowing it. And all the Word of God says, do not allow Satan to get a foothold. Do not allow anger to be a part of your life to where Satan just comes in and he starts doing all kinds of things in your life. Because anger is not a part or should not be a part of, of what takes place in our lives. Then the second thing we see here, not only is he, is he angry? <clears throat> but notice, now, we see also in verse 29 and 30, the father's going to go out there and he's going to talk to him. But notice the self-centered son, representing again the Pharisees, the self-centered Pharisees, you know, self-righteous as they are. Notice, as the older brother became angry, it says in verse 28 and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. Pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all of these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when his, but when the son of yours, you notice that? When the son of yours who has squandered your property, when prostitutes come home, you, what did you do? You killed the fatted calf for him. I'm sure there were many other things that he said as well. So here we have 
the father here, the father's action that we see going out and pleading with the oldest son symbolizes God and Jesus Christ pleading with sinners, but pleading also with his people. Now these are the Jewish people, these are God, godly people. So he goes out and he's pleading with them. However, what do we see? The oldest son accuses the father of being unfair and unjust. This is just not right. This son of yours, he has gone off, he has squandered all of your property, and he's saying to himself, and some of mine too, because I get a double portion of it all, and now he's taking everything. Then he comes back home after he done done had sold his soul toy. He's done all of these terrible things with these prostitutes and everything else, flat out broke, and you welcome him back. That's a disgrace. I mean he's letting his father in he's letting his father have it. Then he proceeds to tell the father all that he had done all of these years. Look what I have done. I have slaved for you all of these years. I've done everything. Was it, and this is reminiscent now of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders always telling, look what I have done. Look at me. Look how, look how good I do. You know, it's reminiscent of them. And Jesus often said this concerning the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Matter of fact, in, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus relates to the crowd concerning just that part of it. He, in, in Matthew chapter 23, in the first few verses, he says, the teachers, he tells to the crowd and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. How, you must be careful to do everything they tell you concerning what Moses has said. However, do not do what they do. Wow, why not? For they do not practice what they preach. You see? This is what's going on. They look good on the outside, but they don't do what they claim to do. They're telling you to do what is right, but they themselves are not doing what is right. Reminiscent of them. They, do, they, they tie up heavy crumbles and loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything is key. Everything they do is for what? For people to see. Their phylacteries, now that was a that was a box, that was a prayer list. Their, their phylacteries are wide and their tassels on their garments are long. They love the place of honor at the banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and they love to be called rabbis by others. But you are not to call them rabbis, for you have only one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have only one father, for he is in heaven. Nor do you call instructed, nor do you being called instructors, for you have only one instructor, and that is the Messiah. For great among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, there was no humbleness as well in the midst of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. It was all about them, everything. And, and, and Jesus, even prior to that, in Matthew chapter 6, on his Sermon on the Mount, he relates as well concerning the practices of these Pharisees and these religious leaders back in his day. In Matthew chapter 6, he relates, he said, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will, not, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to the needy, do, annou do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues on the, on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they receive their rewards in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that when you're giving, you may do it in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, they had, a, they had a thing whenever they would go into the temple treasury 
and they would put the money in the temple tre treasury. They would have people blow the trumpets to let them know that they were putting the money in there so that everybody could see that they were putting the money into the temple treasury so they could be seen by them. The things they did and what they were doing, it was all done for show. But secretively, they were not doing the things that God would have them to do. And here we have the oldest son telling the father, as if the father didn't know it already, Oh, look what I have done for you. All of these years I have slaved for you. All of these years I have done all of these things for you. Look what I have done. And, and if you notice, again, how does he see his brother? Not as his brother, but as his father's son. Never once did he say, oh, yeah, and look what you did for my brother. But it says, your son. It's always that. You see, he had an attitude problem as well. And his attitude was not where it should be or what it should be. He was allowing, again, not only the anger in his life, but also he had the wrong attitude toward the family and toward the father as well. You see, so instead of being happy and joyous, what we see, he was cruel. He was cruel not only to his father, but also to his brother. And it was his brother. He only cared about himself and what was in it for him. Maybe you've met some people like that. Maybe you've even met people like that even in the religious realm, concerning with different things as well. And in it, we see here with this older son, where his care is only about himself. And so what has happened? Anger, resentment, envy, uncaring attitude has been festering now for years. This is not something that happened overnight. This is not something since the younger brother left and then came back. This has been going on. This has been festering. This has been happening. And so now he's letting dad have it all. He's letting the Father know. I tell you, I have been doing this all these years, and look what you've done. You haven't done anything for me. Wow. Nothing. We hear that so many times from some of our kids as well. But we see happening here. But again, Jesus is relating this to the religious people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And this is their attitude toward the sinners and the tax collectors. They said they want to have no part of them. They are not my brothers. They are not my sisters. That's not my family. <coughs> but in reality, we're all brothers and sisters. We have some lost and some saved. We're all from the same place. Go all the way back. Where did it all begin? No, it was after the garden because it was after the flood. See, everyone is descendants of Noah. Everybody. The Lord, we're all there. It all goes back to the same thing. But yet again, in the Lord, we should all be brothers and sisters and caring for each other. Be careful that you don't allow anger, envy, and other things to take the place of what God would have for us. And then we have the last thing that took place. The uncaring son in verse 31 and 32. Notice the conclusion of the parable. As, uh, as the oldest son here lets the father have it and lets it, tells him everything that's on his heart or how he's not happy and how he's, he's angry and what's all been taking place over the years. So in verse 31 and 32, notice he's still uncaring. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we, had, but we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours, not this son of mine, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now isn't this amazing? Here we have the father going out, pleading with the son to come back, to join into the festivities because his brother that was lost has repented and has come back again. 
instead of rebuking or reprimanding the older son, what do we see about the father? He is gracious, compassionate. He's also gentle. Now, even though it appears that the father knew all along that the older son's heart was not right, he still responded to the older son with tenderness and a soft voice. We don't see where the father gets angry. We don't see where the father slaps him around and says, hey, get out of it and, and, and you know, this is not right for the way you're feeling. But he's talking with him. He's pleading with him. Don't be this way. Don't allow this to fester. Don't allow this to control your life. It's no good if you do this. You know, this part of it here, it always reminds me of Elijah. There was Elijah on Mount Carmel. God did everything. I mean, he brought down the lightning, brought down everything, and sucked up everything, and then Jezebel told Elijah, if this day I'm not going to make you like one of the other idols, and something happened to me, so Jezebel threatened Elijah. And instead of Elijah, and we all get there, I'm not blaming Elijah because we all do it. Instead of him saying, yeah, take your best shot, he starts running and running and running. And he's running and running and running. He's running away. And he's running through the desert and everything else. And then as he is, and, and then he gets to the mountain of God, Horab. And as he gets there, it's, it's an interesting thing here that takes place. Uh, and, he, and, there, and he traveled now 40 days and 40 nights. Again, we see another incident where 40 days and 40 nights. He travels 40 days and 40 nights as he travels to the mountain of God. And then the Lord came to him. And, and he said, what are you doing here? But, but the interesting thing is, he's in his cave now, and he says, Lord, I've been zealous for you. And then the Lord tells him in, in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 11. And the Lord says, I want you to go and stand on the mountain in the, in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by you. So he goes out of the cave that he's in, and he's going to go stand outside. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. However, the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind, and in the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there came a fire. Oh, but the Lord was not even in the fire. And after the fire, there came a gentle whisper. Elijah, what are you doing here? Not a rebuke, but a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled the cloak over his face. He went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And the voice of the Lord said, What are you doing here? This is not where you're supposed to be. A gentle whisper. Ple I can see it. Pleading with Elijah, Why are you here? Did you not see what we had did? What I did at, there at, at Mount Carmel? Did you not see all that took place and all that happened? What are you doing here? How many times has the voice of God whispered to us and said, what are you doing? Why are you angry? What are you doing? What are you doing here? Why are you doing all of that? What's the purpose of it? What good will it do for you to get angry, to get upset? What good would it do to be mad at your brother? What good is all of this? The small, still voice of God. I can see the father here doing the same thing and pleading with the oldest son in his parable as he's pleading with him and telling him all of these things. You know, it's more important to be alive than dead. And here we see as, he, as the father relates to the older brother. Your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's far more important to understand that God cares for all people and their soul, their salvation, and their hearts. 
They've heard me say it before. In this parable, we've seen the eldest son and we've seen the oldest son and the representation that takes. But actually, there's a third son. The first son, the old, youngest son, he broke his father's heart. The oldest son, he was out of fellowship with the father. But then there was the third son. And the third son is the one who is speaking and telling the parable. And that third son is Jesus Christ. He came from a far country. And he came to do the will of God the Father. He was not a prodigal son, but he was the son of man. He was the prince of peace. He came for one purpose, to reconcile both back to the Father. He came to reconcile tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, religious leaders, all together to come back and have a relationship with the Father. And he did that by shedding his blood on Calvary, by giving the ultimate sacrifice that I bet no one here would give. He gave his life so that we can be ransomed, so that we can be saved. He gave it by his blood on the cross, which all was a part of the Father's plan, even before the creation of the world. Can you imagine? Even before anything was ever created, this plan was already done, intact. You can read it for yourself as well. We don't know if the oldest son in this parable ever came to his senses like the younger son did. Yet, the door was always open as the father went out and pleaded with him to be reconciled, to be forgiven, to have a change of heart and not allow anger to fester, to not allow resentment or other things to fester and to destroy a relationship not only with the father but also with the brother as well. So the question today is where are you in your relationship with the father? Because you see the relationship with the father will also let you know your relationship to others as well. For if you don't have a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ, how can you have a relationship with other people? With other people. How can you let other people know that Christ lives in your heart and your life? If all you go around is you're angry and uncaring, and if you allow the things of this world to fester in you and not allow Christ and His Word in you, are you like the younger brother, or are you like the older brother? Again, either way, you can never, if you have never publicly put faith or trust in Jesus Christ, you can do that today. If God is speaking to you through Christ, you can come, and you can allow Him to change your heart. And you'll say, well, I can do that on my own. No, you can't. You can't change it on your, on your own. I have yet to see anyone have a heart transplant by, by themselves. Only God, through Jesus Christ, can give you, can change your heart. And Jesus says, from out of the heart comes these things. And only by his blood, and only by his power, can that happen. So the question again is, do you truly have a relationship with the Father, through Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for your sins? Are you allowing the world, yourself, like the, like the religious leaders, or and Satan, to govern what you do or don't do? And it will never end well if you allow Satan, your simple desire, or the world govern what you do. It never, it never will. You, you, you're not, you will not have the peace, the joy, the happiness, and all of the other things if you allow these things to continue to fester in your life. And you may have been 
You may have been in the church all your life, but you truly did not know a peace or joy that comes by knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You may have been like these Pharisees and these religious leaders. You're going through the motions. You're thinking, oh, well, I'm doing all of these, all of these things, all of these things. Look what I'm doing, Lord, look what I'm doing. And yet, you're not doing anything at all because you're only doing it to show people that you're truly not the person that you should be or the person that you could be in Jesus Christ. There's a lot more to it than that. But yet, it's simple. It is so simple that many people just overlook it. And the simpleness of it is that Christ came to die for sinners. And you have to recognize, I have to recognize, we have to recognize, I am a sinner in need of Jesus Christ. Lord and Savior. I, again, I don't know if the oldest son came to the realization of it. The youngest son did. But the oldest son, we don't know if did. I think some of the Pharisees and religious leaders, like Nicodemus and some of the others, they came to know Jesus Christ. They repented of their sin. They came to follow him. They did not allow the teachings and the ways of that to govern what they do instead they realized indeed God did send his son so that I can have eternal life so that I can have a new life so the question is is do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior do you know him in your heart not just here in your head intellectually but in your heart do you know him you can do it today if God is relating this to you now. Let's stand. Almighty God, as we come again before you, Lord, and if there's anyone here today, regardless of who they are, or how long they've been coming here, or whomever they may be, and if you have spoken to them today, Lord, and their heart is not right before you, I pray that they will heed your calling. I pray they will heed your voice and that you will whisper to them softly and say, please come. As you all come, come, let's have a true relationship. I pray today they will come and know you as their Lord, as Lord and Savior, but also as your Father. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. If God has spoken to you today, you come as we sing 281, Speak to My Heart.
spoken to us and that from this parable of last week and also today, we see the changes that took place within people's lives. And again, how does it take place? Uh, the power of our Lord Jesus Christ as he changes our hearts from what we used to be to what we could be and should be as well as we follow him. Again, I pray that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, not just intellectually, but in your heart. We invite you to come back Wednesday night. Again, this coming Wednesday, we have Wednesday night Bible study from 6 o'clock to 7 p.m., and all are welcome to come. If not, we'll come back next week, 9 o'clock. We have Sunday school. Yes, we'll have it on the 4th of July as well. We have Sunday school at 9 o'clock for all who would like to come if you're here. And we'll have worship service from 10.30 to 11.30, 11.45, who knows, you know, until the Lord tells us, okay, it's time up. So you come as you would like to come and worship with us as we worship God in spirit and truth every Sunday as the Lord allows us to do. I pray God's blessing upon each and every one and that you may have a good day today, but also not only a good day, but also walk with the Lord today and this week. Have a relationship. Speak to the Father. Whatever is on your heart, let him know what it is, and he will answer you. This I can tell you from his word and also from experience as well. So I pray God's blessing upon each and every one. Al, lead us in a closing prayer, sir. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you, thanking you for all that you've done, thanking you for giving your life the Father we might have. I pray, Lord, and I thank you for your word, your message. And, Father, I pray, and I know that we all need to look at our hearts. And, the Father, there is things that are not right. But as Christians, Father, you show us, and you open up to us. And, the Father, where there is jealousy, you take it away. Where there is hard feelings, you take it away. You know, Father, we want to fall short sometimes. But we know that you are there all the time to pick us up and put us in the right direction. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with us as we leave this gathering, that you'll watch over us, keep us, and bring us back to worship again together. In my son's precious name we pray. Amen.